the NAACP, Pastor Dr. Nagels, you and I had a chance to chat and as president of the local branch of the NAACP. And I, I came up under the NAACP. We are the so oldest and the baddest and the longest serving <laughs> of our civil rights organizations. And you have been uh, the president of several branches in that, for that matter. What is the significance of the reparations resolution to Evans' black community and the entire city from your perspective? Dr. Daniels and to esteemed members of the panel and to the host pastor, my good and dear friend, and to all the men Simmons for the amazing work that you've done. Uh, I'm grateful to represent the NAACP tonight. Um, Dr. Daniels has stolen some of my thunder, but I'll say it anyway. We are the oldest and the boldest. The strongest and the longest. Civil rights organization in our nation. Founded in 1909, you've heard already that we branch began in 1918. We just celebrated our 101st year in November. The branches have members and leaders who stood in the vanguard of Black Evanston during their time and even today. George Mitchell, Bennett Thompson, Hecky Powell, Carl Davis, Elsie Liddell, Catherine Bridges, Jerry Sizemore, and many, many more, have all stamped their genius and gifts on the branch. For these 100 years, the long night of struggle has included striving for equity in education, justice in City Hall, equal protection in law enforcement, affordable housing, and workforce development. I would suggest tonight, both from the energy of this beautiful First Church of God and in the precise language of the reparations resolution, I would suggest a change that finally arrived. A glowing, fluorescent, and glittering change. Victor Hugo wrote, there's nothing so great as an idea whose time has come. Yeah. Dr. King wrote, we are living in the great urgency of now. Yeah. For the NAACP, the resolution means that a long overdue idea has finally come to pass. And it could not come any quicker or more timely than the urgency of now. That's the old of the marvel and majesty of this unique and historical moment. White nationalism is rising quicker than water levels of the oceans. One due to global warming and the other due to heart squeezing. The Southern Poverty Law Center has shared that hate and bias crimes are occurring with much greater frequency. We have a foreign policy White House advisor who regularly cohorts with white racist organizations. He is himself a white racist. We have the awful reality of elected white racists, white racists on federal benches, white racists and NFL owners. In the midst of all of this darkness, there has appeared a sliver of light jettisoning across the surface of the chilly waters of Lake Michigan. In a town no more for academic excellence than anything else, that light hurled forth by a woman named Rama. <laughs> by a council in the city of Evanston, that light is just beginning to glow. Yes. And so it is our duty, not just those on this stage, not just those who wrote and voted on the resolution, but it is our duty, every single one of us in this building tonight, to let this light shine. For if we let it shine, if we allow its glow to reflect near and far, from Chicago to Chattanooga, from Detroit to Dallas, from Miami to Maine, from Seattle to Santa Fe, then the idea of the urgency of now will bless our nation, our seniors, our children, and all people. Black, white, yellow, red, and brown, Republicans and Democrats, rich and poor, gay and straight, and we will all win reparations and deal racism a crushing blow. That's what it means to be. Submission was invited to Edison by Alderman Simmons and the Reparations Subcommittee 
to support this initiative by providing background information, background and information on the definitions of reparations, the international law governing the preparatory justice process, the historical precedents for reparations, the historic struggle by African, African Americans to achieve reparations in the U.S., and finally, what are the basic criteria for reparations for a reparations initiative? So I'm going to begin now with Ken Howard, who is the national male co-chair of this awesome organization, COBA. By asking him, would you be, um, and COBA has been the leading organization pushing for reparations for decades. Would you please define reparations and outline the process required to achieve full reparations? It has to be succinct, but do us that, dude. Would you please say that? First, I want to thank the city of Edmonton for hosting us here. Thank you very much. So, Ecuador has defined reparations as a process of repairing, healing, and restoring people who were injured due to our group identity and violation of our very fundamental human rights by government, corporation, institution, or individual. Key to that healing is the concept of what is called full reparations or full repair, which is an international term. Under international law and international norms, reparations must, quote, wipe out all consequences, unquote, of the injury. So crimes were committed, like the crimes of enslavement and the crimes of Jim Crow segregation and all the post Jim Crow crimes that were committed, and the, all the injuries that we suffer from today, reparations must, under international norms, wipe out all of those consequences. In order to do that, there's a term called full repair. And full repair has five major components. First component is cessation and guarantees and non-repetition. So whatever bad acts are being created, still being created, they must be halted. And, and policies and, and structures must, must be put in place to halt them from being repeated. In America, there are many laws that have a disproportionate effect, negative effect on people of African descent. They're not called black codes, or the, you know, talked about the black codes that were in existence in the 1800s. They're not called black codes today, but they still have the same negative disproportionate effect on people of African descent in this country, and we have to halt those laws. There's some that were mentioned earlier that are here in Edison. The second component of full repair is restitution. How do you return people back to where they would have been had these crimes not been committed in the first place? Now, these are the many educational initiatives that we talk about when we talk about reparations, the economic initiatives, the housing initiatives, the initiatives that deal with um, uh, community development, those type of things, bring us back to what we would have been if we hadn't been redlined, if we hadn't been um, Jim Crow, et cetera. The third component of full repair is compensation. Yes, compensation is a component of, of reparations under international law. We're not going to sidestep that issue. But we know that compensation in, this, in and of itself will not bring us to full repair. And that's why these other issues, are, other areas, are necessary. The fourth component is satisfaction. How do you turn the dignity back to the people whose dignity was eroded as a lot of the crimes you committed against us? I always use the example that I was in China a few years ago, and every morning when I left out of my hotel, I walked across, walked down the street. And all the Chinese women were walking on the side of the sidewalk as I came by. And that's because of the projected image that this country is down for black and pale, that the black and pale is coming up no matter where it goes. And so how do we need to get our identity back? First, we have to begin telling this true history that this nation was created in criminal actions. And we begin from that point. In addition, apologies, museums, markers, those things meet the criteria of uh, satisfaction, but a, a complete curriculum change in this country must be another one. The third component of uh, reparations is rehabilitation for the mind, heart, and spirit damage. In COVID, at our, our 31st uh, convention in June, and our theme for the year was 400 years of terror against the road. We have experienced uninterrupted terror in this country for 400 years. And we know that that terror has had an impact not only on us psychologically, but also on us physically. Because that we know that there's now science that said trauma and terror affects your DNA. The more you have done with your DNA. I said it earlier, I'm in here, is that in the 2005 
a reparations lawsuit with Judge Lane Judge Lane about this argument. The judge who made a ruling on that case says, you're too far removed from the injury. So you don't have standing to bring the lawsuit. We're not removed at all because it's in our DNA. Right now, together. It is in our DNA. We're still living the effects of enslavement right now. And that's why I pull it here at that time. Paiva, I know it's difficult, but would you share a bit about the history of the struggle by African Americans to achieve reparations and some of the historical precedents for achieving reparations? And I say it because this is a dynamic system, so she can, you know, we have to, she might get the Holy Ghost up in it, so I, I have to kind of constrain her a little bit. Attorney Paiva. All right, so it might be cold outside, but this issue is out. <laughs> Let me just say emphatically that the concept of reparations for black people in America is not novel, nor is the demand for such compensation new. Reparations definitely did not originate with the 2020 candidates vying for the Democratic nomination, though that might have brought some mainstream attention to the issue. It didn't fall from the side with the publication of Donald Hawthorne Coates' treatise in the Atlantic magazine, The Case of Reparations. Though that article did serve to catapult the debate clearly into living rooms and into college classrooms and into pulpits. Uh, and as brilliant, bold, and audacious as she is. He is our brother. We love him. He is our ambassador. Would you please welcome Danny Glover. Humanity as well. 
is a man who sang and spoke in more than 12 languages, who understood the relationship between the music of Africa and the music, the, the Mozarts and the different music in the very place in the world, who understood the origin. Educate. This is a an extraordinary moment and an extraordinary moment for us to celebrate. No doubt about that. The it work that all of them, Robin, Sue Simmons, and and those who work and support her, those citizens, and those also those all of them and members, have stood out and put their foot in the fire and stood in the fire to make this happen. This conversation right there, right now, this conversation where we had right now, at the beginning of the work that has to be done, the generational work, the work that we stepped into, the work by our dear brother, Professor Charles Ogletree. Thank you. One of the teachers of our former president, Barack Obama. Yeah. The work of the, one of the co-founders of Trans Africa Forum, Randall Robinson. We all remember Randall. He served not only for liberation and the end of colonialism and the end of apartheid, the end of, of Freedom the fight. regimes Freedom fight. in Namibia in other places in South Southern Africa, but also stood up in defense of the greatest revolution that ever occurred in this, in this history of ours that we could tell the Haitian Revolution yeah. and the creation of people. Because we cannot talk about liberation, we can't talk about the sacrifices made by the Haitian people and continue to be made by the Haitian people for their glorious triumph. Triumph. Glorious triumph. Yeah. Over colonialism. Mm -hmm. So we, we have this moment and with all our due thanks, but we are at not a beginning to say, because we've traveled and journeyed this place. We're at another place where the discourse now becomes another discourse. Yes, this city has stepped out yes, yes. in the fire. This city will always remember, but what we do, what we do tomorrow, what we do day in, day out, at this point, as we understand the public city and the expansiveness of this idea. It's the idea that my great grandmother had. She didn't know how to Articulated, but she kept it. Born in 1858. It's how I did those who come before who not only spoke about liberation and freedom and the end of slavery. It's that idea that we step into and we enlarge that idea. We take into consideration not only their lives, but the lives of their children and children and children and children and children and children. And children. That's where we are right now. We're talking about this, this narrative that we're talking about. And it has to be our commitment. Right here, as we sit here, every single one of us, it has to be our sole commitment as human beings. As human beings. I'm the goodwill ambassador for this decade of African descendants. There are two, more than 200 million African descendants in the hemisphere. I mean 200 million, whether it's the tip of Canada all the way down to Bolivia, to Argentina. They own 200 million. 90% of them live in poverty. 90% of them live in poverty. The largest number of African descendants outside of Nigeria is in Brazil itself. With a great murder rate of young black males in Brazil it's so horrific. It outdistances what happens here and here. Then we talk about that. We understand that. So when we step out here, we're talking about reparations for African 
And as committed as we are, including it being one of our core goals at the City Council, we still maintain a wealth disparity of $46,000 between Blacks and Whites and Evans. We continue a life expectancy gap of 13 years. We continue to have our achievement gap and opportunity gap. Our black home ownership rate is declining at its lowest point since the 1960s. The black community had been in an exodus because of lack of affordability and place in Edmonton. And it was time to lead in urgency. It was time to do something as radical as the oppression and discrimination as an impact from the Jim Crow law and the redlining, something as radical as enslavement and torture and crimes of humanity. It was time to be unapologetic and uncompromising and bold and reparations. There was nothing more to do. We had done it all here at Edison, and we do it with all of our heart. And I mean that. We work hard here in Edison. Most people are here because they enjoy our diversity. Next, our trees and beach. I don't know what it is, but uh, diversity is key. And we needed to be true to that. We needed to move our efforts beyond apology and ceremony. And we needed to bring action. And a reparative policy is what I felt was the next option, and really the only option based on everything that we had done. And that's what motivated me, included overcoming some things in the neighborhood that I serve. I live in Census Tract 8092, which has the low spectrum of the disparity in all things. And it was time that um, I moved forward. And that was my motivation. Right. Pastor Dillard, you are not only the pastor of Sway Church, but as an extension of your work in the tradition of Adam Clayton High, frankly, you are also out there in the community. So you serve on the Equity and Empowerment Commission. What motivated you to become involved in this mission? And what role has the commission played play in bringing the initiative to this point? Uh, yes, the Equity and Empowerment Commission is actually relatively new in the city. Uh, just now going into our second year. And truthfully, we are tasked with uh, looking at you know, all things through the lens of how does this specific function affect everyone, whether that's ableism, uh, racism, sexism. We, we, we kind of have a very broad spectrum and spent, uh, spent and continue to spend a lot of time uh, to do that. And in my personal assessment, because I, I can't speak for the commission itself, but my personal uh, assessment was that, um, as a matter of fact, I stated in one of our meetings that we had to go where the work is taking us. Uh, we were really trying to find identity and, and pursuit, given the vast number of things. And we still continue to do that. We have a lot of work to do yet. Uh, but one thing we found is that the work always took us to disparities that affected African Americans. Even if it's a matter of ableism, um, people who are disabled are often not considered in how buildings are built. Uh, one of the largest restaurant food chains, 75% uh, of all of their work is driving, but if you're deaf, you have to get out, right? So, but we realize that even in matters of ableism or sexism, there's an issue, but if you're black and have that issue, it's even worse. 